and of course, you can't just talk about observations, right? Because they're all like hand in hand, and also because I, I've been doing a bunch of different things uh, in various domains. And so, of course, you've got a, the observations, they're represented by beautiful planet nebula, of course, that validate both the theory and the simulation, to which all should be in, in, in step with one another. And everything has to be pumped into the population synthesis, which make use of all the knowledge to synchronize the populations and give us predictions such as type 1 rates, for example. Um, so there's a lot, it turns out, of observations, much more than one thing. And uh, as a result, I had to crop the amount of stuff I'm going to talk about. And unfortunately, I'm not going to review massive post-common envelope objects. There actually are quite a few. There are amazing millisecond pulsars with main sequence companions, which, by the way, should not exist, but they do. And I don't, don't, do not know very much about it, so I decided just to leave them aside and stick to the low mass material that I've been working with. So I'll talk about the classics, the post-common envelope low mass stars with one um, evolved object and one uh, main sequence companion. <coughs> I will talk about a very weird class of wider objects, which I call post-common envelope, uh, and may probe the early onset of common envelope. I'll talk about a little bit about light, light curves and transients. This is work that I think is going to come um, uh, to fruition in the next five to 10 years. And I'll talk about the nebula and jets that we do see that are common envelope that also can impose some constraints. Um, so let's start with the longest part of the talk, which is um, this plentiful database of detached, close, uh, single degenerates, um, which imply one common envelope event uh, of low inter intermediate mass colors. So what do they look like, and how do we find them? Usually, we find them by photometric variability that is brought about by uh, either eclipses, ellipsoidal variability, or irradiation. And here, there's a couple of examples. Here, you have the irradiation effect plus some overlapping uh, eclipses. Here you have irradiation effect as well as ellipsoidal variability that gives you two cycles of variabilities for one period. And you see it here in unequal troughs. So this is how we find them. And uh, um, what we would like to do with them is find the parameters of the object today, such as the core mass, core because it was the core of the giant, is today's primary, and the secondary, and the final separation, post common envelope, which is today's separation. And then, with some magic trick, you can invert these quantities and determine how the system looked like before the common envelope that will give you envelope masses and initial separations and things like that. And if you do that successfully, then you can derive the alpha of the famed alpha common envelope equation. Now, you can argue that this equation is not what we want to have, and I will argue that it's not what we want to have. But I'm just using it here as a parameterization that we are using today, and the population synthesis are using to do a lot of stuff. And so either we give them a good alpha that works, or we give them a new equation that works. Um, so how do they do it? Well, the population synthesis folks say, well, I have my families of binaries. I know everything about them, the primary, the secondary, and so on. What I want to predict is the final separation. And to do so, I need to invent an alpha, or I need to ask you guys who do other types of work what alpha is. And this prediction is fundamental, because if it's little, you're going to get, say, mergers more readily and a higher rate of, say, type 1a supernovae. Or if it's larger, you might never merge. And this is also true for gravitational wave producers. It's really important to get uh, to connect to those phenomena. So let's look at the system that we are trying to invert in order to get this alpha. And here's the system today, and here's the system at the time of common envelope. Now today, we can measure. I say measure in inverted commas because, of course, everything is model dependent. But you can find um, the masses of the two stars, the periods and final separations, and other things such as orbital parameters. And then you do some magic by using the, the laws of physics and the laws of um, the stellar structure and evolution, and from these numbers, primarily this number, you determine what it looked like at the beginning. And what you want is the, uh, the primary and, and radius of the star, and that will do the trick. So people have been at this for quite a while. There's been uh, a lot of people involved with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and this is one of the, uh, one of the key papers. This is what the spectrum of these binaries look like. Um, if you have a white dwarf, even a late M star shines through, and you're lucky because you can fit and get spectral modeling. And that gives you a half decent idea of what the masses are now. There's a lot of caveats. Like, they don't really have the distances. Gaia will help. At the moment, they just do main sequence fitting. There's a lot of um, 
issues with that, and they have actually relatively large error bars. So even the measurement, what you should be more sure about, is not as great as you think. If you don't have a wide dwarf and you have something brighter, such as central star planet nebula, they're pre-wide dwarfs, they're pretty hot, but they're still very luminous, then your um, companion doesn't shine through and you have other techniques. This is a beautiful object that we did with Kepler, where you have the luminosity variability, um, you presume it's a binary, so you go after it with radial velocity, and you find that it is nice, a nice binary. And then you, do, you have a spectrum, so you can do log GT effective for the primary. And then you do this um, geometric light model fits, such as wilson davini code-like fits, and you can get a decent idea of the parameters. This was not the best I've ever, we've ever had, and you can see how the parameters are not great. They are actually ranges. Um, the reason I put it up is because it was a Kepler object that had two characteristics that I wanted to mention. One of them is that this variability, I told you about ellipsoidal variability, irradiation, and eclipses, this is none of those. This is actually Doppler beaming, and it's the first time we found it in a central star of planetary nebula, and it's found thanks to the fact that Kepler is amazing. Uh, so it's a tiny, look, it's a very, very small amplitude. Um, and there is a little bit of ellipsoidal, sorry, irradiation, which is there, but it's mostly Doppler beaming. The other thing is with Kepler, we thought we would find the wider periods, maybe the three days, the five days, the two weeks, because those would have a smaller amplitude. And we found tons of small amplitude things, but none of them had a long period or a longer period. They were all three days, one day, half a day, implying, once again, and many people have had this result, that the common envelopes really shrink the orbit. Almost nothing is left at five days or 10 days. It really is something. And there's something already in this information that tells you nothing is left at um, slightly longer periods. Now, in order to invert the, your, your observations and determine what they look like at the time of common envelope, you need to determine what this core, these hot stars, look like at the time of common envelope. Was it an RGB star, an AGB star, or maybe a subgiant a sub star? So you need to figure out where it is here. And the type of objects we have are CO and helium white dwarfs, some central stars of planet Nebula, and we have some SQV stars, which are helium burning low mass stars that went through some kind of common envelope on the RGB when they were very close to the top of the RGB. And I think Philip was the one that uh, figured out a scenario for those. And then they start, they ignite helium core um, anyway, and then they have, they live here with uh, a companion. Now, um, in order to understand what your observed system looked like at the time of common envelope, it's actually, there is some ambiguity, and I'll show you in a second. If you have log GNT effective and some trucks, you can start distinguishing um, where these objects are, but ultimately there is an ambiguity that gives you a big error bar. So when you reconstruct from the measurement to the, at the time of common envelope, what you want to remember is the mass and the radius of the <coughs> common envelope object, the, the giant, you have a choice of whether the thing was on the AGB or on the RGB. And at the moment, everybody makes the choice based on the mass of your core. If it's about 0.5, that's your helium burning limit. I use 0.47, that doesn't matter. It's 0.47 to 5, 0.5. And you make a decision whether you're gonna to go to an AGB reconstruction or an RGB. And here you have the problem start. If you have an RGB reconstruction, you decide my 0.3 solar mass core used to be a core of an RGB star. But the problem is you don't know whether this was a massive RGB star that was caught in the common envelope early or a less massive RGB star that was caught in the common envelope late. So you have to kind of find an average mass that will statistically fit the bill. And of course, you see the problem that you're going to have a mass, which is statistical, it's going to have a big error bar. And that mass will have, of course, the corresponding radius. So the AGB is a little bit easier in some ways, harder in other ways. Your core mass can be uh, assumed to be the final mass, and with the initial to final mass relation, you get the mass sequence mass, and some mass loss model, you can get the mass of the AGB giant at the time of common envelope. And then there is actually a core mass radius relation that you can use for the radius. And so these are some advantages, some advantages. The problem is there is ambiguity. You could have a five solar mass object which develops a 1.1 solar mass core as it goes up to the RGB for the first time. It's caught in the common envelope at that time, and here you get a nice massive object that you're gonna interpret as a seven solar mass AGB star, but in fact it was a five solar mass RGB object with a much higher binding energy. Now of course, more massive stars are rarer, and this saves our chops a little bit because the mistakes are done less frequently. Um, 
This is just uh, two examples from a couple of papers, one of mine and, and one of Monica Zorotovich, showing what the alpha that was implied by applying the equation you saw before, as well as this reconstruction technique. And of course, error bars galore everywhere. Um, and um, the difference between these two papers was actually not as much as it looks. We decided to fit the data with uh, an anti-correlations with, uh, with, with um, the mass ratio. You see the error bars are huge. This is a log scale. Um, Monica did not, but at the same time, actually, the data were not that dissimilar. The only thing I'd like you to take away from this is that the AGV seemed to systematically imply a lower alpha than the RGB objects. Um, now, I'm going to start with this plot, and I'm going to spend quite some time on it because it's complicated. This is another way of plotting the very same data you've seen in the previous slide. This is the binding energy of the object at the time of common envelope, and this is the shrinkage of the orbit on the x-axis expressed as the delta orbital energy. Now, for one second, just to concentrate on the little flies, the black dots. Um, the round ones are the RGB stars, and triangular ones are the AGB stars. And if I just highlight the areas they occupy, you see what we've seen before, that the RGB stars um, have imply a larger alpha than the AGB stars. And actually, what this also means is that for some reason, the AGB stars with a lower binding energy, we all know they do have a lower binding energy, don't seem to shrink less. If they shrunk less, they would be up here, and they would be forming a more coherent picture. Um, they rather seem to be quite special. These fluffy envelopes with low binding energy still manage to get this in spiral to shrink quite a lot. Now, um, this is kind of the only thing I'm going to say about the observations, which is what I just said before. Let's take a look at the colorful dots, which are all simulations. They're not all the simulations we have, they're just a subset. Let's start with this uh, uh, crosses here, which are Natasha's paper uh, is the, the, your, what's his first name? Jose? Jose. Um, the 16 paper. These are the simulations that unbind the envelope. So I felt, fair enough, I can put them on this because they unbind the envelope. And um, they imply high alpha, which is also what I believe the paper on Natasha says in a slightly different way. And we were kind of um, happy to leave them there. I also would notice that they kind of cut across the RGB observations. These were RGB stars, so nothing uh, un un unusual there. Um, what about the other observations, the other simulations? These ones, and of course, the Russian review there. This is Paul simulations, Sebastian Ullman. These are ours. This is uh, Luke's. And this is a, a kind of an aggregate of the sample simulation. Why would one ever put them on a diagram like that, given that they don't unbind the envelope? And the reason I even thought about putting them on this diagram is because Natasha's simulations, if you reproduce them with or without recombination energy, the final separation is about the same. And that is because, as we have learned from that paper, when um, you, you first in spiral and you reach your final separation, and then the, the, the recombination energy kicks in and ejects the envelope. So why does the in spiral stop? Why do we get these values of AF? Because you are evacuating the orbit somewhat, or you're bringing the gas in the orbit into corrotation. Interestingly, when every time I've checked, either of these two mechanisms or a combination of the two is at play. But ultimately, I thought, well, what if there is a relationship between the ability to evacuate the orbit and the total weight of the envelope? Now, it wouldn't be an alpha thing, but maybe I thought there would be some structure. However, as you can see, um, some of the known envelope unbinding simulations, these, these and the Serrazi and Livio, are in line with the Natasha simulations. But then there's stuff that up there. Now, what you can draw from this is a bunch of um, kind of conclusions. So some simulations have alpha larger than one, right? And you can say, well, of course, because they don't unbind the envelope. So if you did the delta E binding, they would come down. However, there are, there are simulations that don't unbind the envelope that are very much in line with that trend. And the reason is that the problem with this E binding is that we always look at the binding energy, which is an average binding energy of the whole envelope. However, that can be um, made up of, uh, say, a bound part of the envelope and an unbound part of the envelope, where the unbound has positive energy and the bound has negative energy. And on average, you have an unbound envelope. So this just highlights the problem that, um, that this uh, equation does not very much represent what's going on in the simulations. 
So if you think about it, it, maybe it's better to think about the in spiral, where you have many delta orbital energies, so many little payloads of energy delivery, each of which has a different alpha, and each of which will overcome or not the binding energy of that shell, where that shell can be either ejected pew, like crazy. In fact, in all simulations, we see the initial plume being ejected at very high speeds. Or in other cases, as you go in, you might not eject, but you're lifting and evacuating the orbit and determining a final separation. So how do you describe that? How do you compare it to the observations that give you such a simplistic view? So the problem is what gets unbound, what speed, when and how the orbit stabilizes must depend on the structure of the envelope and not just on the total binding energy or its weight. And it's very hard to find, at least for all simulations, some kind of story that can be depicted with the simplistic comparison we've seen before. Now, one more item. This is something that really gets me going. This is Eric Sandquist's simulations, OK? Um, it was a simulation. Well, actually, it's the only simulations that do not do low mass RGB stars. They did slightly higher mass AGB stars. And I worked with Eric, and this code at the beginning was my first paper. And I, uh, in fact, so I started here. And what is really interesting is that they have alpha. Look, half, beautiful. Now, they don't unbind the envelope at all. So how do they get alpha? Well, well I calculate their alpha, I get about one. So what's the difference? You reread this paper, I must have read it a hundred times. And every time I reread it, I find something new in it. For some reason, it's just creeping in. And what they did, they took the binding energy of the stuff that was unbound. I'm not sure how you do that with grid codes, but let's assume they used the shell of the stuff that was unbound. And then they compared it to what I believe to be the total, bind, the total orbital energy, which doesn't actually make much sense. Because you perhaps compare it to the delta orbit of the beginning when you're actually unbinding the stuff. So these numbers are in the Zorotovich paper as a comparison to theory. Okay? So, uh, so, so I mean, how do you define the envelope? Well, that's another thing, I mean, right? What's the is, core? It, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's right. There's a so, solar evolution theory way, and there, there's this way. <laughs> but this, this, the, what they unbind is a tiny amount, right? It's right at the top. Yeah. So. And of course, they're clear about it. They do explain what they do, but then people just will use it as the usual alpha. Now, Jason will talk about his paper, but I would like to just say one thing. So this is a novel and different way to get alpha using 1D stellar structure, not, no observations and no simulations. Um, so he does some kind of magic and decides how in each of his stars, the, the in spiral, it will tell you about it. I don't want to steal his thunder too much, um, how the in spiral arrives at the final separation. And it tells us that convective regions play a role in that they transport energy out on very short time scales and hence give you low alpha. And here, alpha looks like a zebra with, with different mass stars behaving very differently with very different alphas. Now, I took home two things from his paper. The first one is stellar structure matters because it redistributes the efficiency of the spiral, in this case, through convection. The other one is this is not the same alpha that we have in simulations. Because the simulations are adiabatic. They don't leak, right? So this alpha is through radiating out or transporting energy out by convection or radiation. Whereas the alphas in simulations are more ejecting stuff too fast, wasting energy by the beginning of the plume. So we, again, once we have to be very careful with this alpha number. Now, going back to, um, to the population synthesis, we all know how it works. Um, I hear a lot of people who say, oh, you cannot know anything from population synthesis, just too many error bars, too many. But I disagree. So population synthesis is the way that we keep saying. We put all this knowledge together with the error bars, and then figure out if we can say anything about rates of supernova 1A or things like that. So every time, when I used to work in single stars, every time I saw this, my eyes glazed over, because there's so many combinations, right? And so the population synthesis will just give you uh, a, 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 a bag full of the physics that we know of stars, full of the physics that we know of galactic evolution, initial mass function, and things like that. And then we'll, they'll produce a bunch of things. Some are predictions, which we will test in the future. Some are things like period distributions, which we can test today, and see whether there's any uh, agreement between, say, the alpha 
and, uh, and what the unknown predictions might look like. Obviously, this is from a massive star paper of uh, the Belchinsky code. You have several phases of common envelope, and of course, you appreciate that the final separations matter tremendously as to deciding what happens and how, how long it takes for things to happen after that. Now, this is from uh, Sylvia's paper of Loma stars. We go back to Loma star <coughs> regime. And what you have here is the period and the mass of the white dwarf for our uh, single degenerate uh, binaries. The dots are observations, and the clouds are the observational, uh, the, 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 the population synthesis predictions. Now, notice one thing. I'm not going to talk about this distribution, and I'm not going to talk about the gamma common envelope, which perhaps we can put in the, in the, in the, in the discussion later. All I want you to so see is that predictions say there are systems up here with periods of 10 days to 100 days, right? But we know they really don't exist. There's very few, if any. If the alphas reduce down to point to 0.25. 0.25, okay? Then, of course, you're eliminating the longer periods. However, I would like to see a histogram of this rather than a cloud because I think there's still quite a prediction of longer periods, even with low alphas. So we still have this issue that is these systems shrink too much by any theory, any alpha you want to have. So uh, this is part one. Part two is I'd like you to think a little bit about these other systems, which you would not call post-common envelope at all, but I will. So these are post-HGB main sequence plus main sequence binaries in periods, the longest of which are definitely have avoided the common envelope, but the shortest of which have must have been caught in some kind of common envelope. On this plane, once again, you have the post-HGB uh, objects and, um, and the primaries here, they're not white dwarfs, they're not in STOB stars, they're not hot. They're actually quite cool, 6,000 Kelvin, and they're large. They're like tenths of solar radii. Now, um, a while ago, in fact, in 2003, I still remember the poster that re reported this finding. Um, Hans von Winkel found that amongst all post-AGB stars, of which we know many, some seem to have a near-infrared excess indicative of a warm disk. And when the closest of these objects were observed with the VLTI, this is a reconstructed VLTI uh, pseudo-image, um, you find the disks. They are warm, they're about 0 0.0 something solar mass, they are about 10 AU to 100 AU in, in radius, and they are pervasively there. And in addition, every time you see this SCD, there's a binary in it. It's amazing. You know, usually say, I'll predict there's a binary, and then there's a binary every 100 times. In this case, always. And what is interesting is the binary periods of these objects are between, say, 80 days and about 2,000 days is the black dots. The other ones are actually a different population. OK, so what are we, how do you make those binaries? 80 days have not avoided some mass transfer where the mass transfer may or may not have been stable. This is my uh, uh, picture of what they look like. Um, they're actually detached, even if this is very big, uh, with these distances, and they are inside these disks. Now, if we think of now the picture that we have so far, we have the classic guys that we talked about with very, very short separations. We have the ones that we know some of that are wide, they've not gone through a common envelope, they've picked up some wind maybe, they've done wind rush of overflow, but they're really large and widen the periods through mass loss. And then we have these post AGB guys. Now, recently we did a paper, and actually Morgan did one too, very similar, um, trying to think about what can be early, let's call it the early common envelope, right? So it's actually Rochelle overflow, but it is unstable and eventually goes into a common envelope. What we did here was the same as a simulation of buses. There's nothing new, except we really took care to model the early phases by giving as much resolution as we could. So um, do as good a job on the early phases as possible. And what you notice is that this guy loses masses to L2 and L3 and forms a disk. Also, what you notice is that if you take this very same simulation and start it a little bit closer or with lower resolution, the final separation is closer. So from this, we surmise that the, the, if, if you model the uh, Rochelob overflow phase, which is unstable, but it's there for a while, and you model it better, you end up with a wider final separation. In addition, we, um, there was a result literally three months ago that tells us that these objects have a Q of about one. That tells me that this should not be unstable mass transfer. It's almost stable. But if the object is an AGB, the AGB is not stable. So 
who knows where this Q is going to, what you really can have, even with a high Q ratio, um, when you have an AGB star. So the question is, can we put the Q up in here, model the Rochdoborover flow, create a better disk and a weaker common envelope, and be left at the separations that we observe? Question mark. Third part, the transients. Um, of course, we'll talk about intermediate luminosity red transients. They've been called all kinds of things. Uh, no matter what you call them, the referee will say, oh, that's not a good name. Uh, red Nova, um, you will pick your own favorite. This is a Mansi uh, um, diagram from a while ago, and of course, we all know that between the Nova and the Supernova, there's a space that used to be sparsely populated, and today has a lot more objects. These are, of course, the very famous, and Natasha talked about the 1309 scope. The A3A Monoceroides uh, was another example. We believe today that some BL, um, uh, LBV stars if they had been observed outbursting, they would have come into this diagram. There's a nice paper by Nathan Smith talking about a new class of LDVs that may have been um, uh, transients. And of course, no one introduced, I'm not sure if he's the one introduced the idea, but I'll, I'll credit him with it, of the fact that many pre-planetary nebulae, rather than being the, the mummies and the daddies of the planetary nebulae, actually are outbursting events of their own right and possibly mergers. And there's papers by uh, Eric and Jason uh, explaining how that could work. Because we have all these uh, wonderful surveys now, we actually have light curves for many of these objects. Many of these are extragalactic, they're rare, so if you have nice surveys, you'll find them extragalactic, and they will be massive stars. So kind of not exactly what we really want to compare to the low mass simulations. I really like this paper by Morgan. There was also a paper by Nadia, very similar, a very different system. But I particularly like this paper by Morgan because from the light curves and you know the, the colors and things like that, he gave us some nice parameters that can be compared with simulations, such as the growth of the photospheric radius, of course the luminosity, and the temperature of the photosphere. I particularly like this because in the meantime, I've been trying to do the light curve like half of the people in this room, and we've done it in a most obvious way to do it at first approximation, which is you take your distribution from 3D, you integrate in, you find a photosphere, and of course, because you got the, 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 the distribution of stuff, you know everything. You know the photosphere is, you know what the temperature is, so you can do a first approximation. Now, it turns out it's harder than that. Um, you can locate the photosphere and, know, and monitor its growth over the initial phases of the common envelope. Something that could be, these are very different systems, but you can you know, compare it if you do the right simulation. What you can't do with this method is do the light curve, because you actually, you can go in the cell where your photosphere is, and you can check what the temperature in that cell is, but then you realize the cell in front and the cell behind have such huge temperature gradient that you're gonna be off by 1.2, 1.3, 1.5, and of course, if you're off by that in temperature, luminosity is gonna be off by a lot more. So, this I-band light curve has huge error bars. And obviously, we can't, this is not a good method to do it. But this is not bad, because this photosphere is located relatively precisely within a cell, which is pretty uh, decent. Um, so we tried to take this, um, this uh, work as far as we could. We looked at what um, our simulation implied in terms of brightnesses. We put it on this cogenic plot that uh, plots the mass of the progenitor versus the, uh, the luminosity, both pre-outburst and during the outburst, and our plot, our dot comes here for this mass, which is a bit high, but you know, given what the, the huge, um, actually this is a lower than it should be even higher, um, uh, it's actually fair enough. But we stopped here, and I'm assuming in the next five years, somebody in this room will have taken this, this to the next good step. Finally, jets and ejecta. Okay, what I'm not going to talk about is going to be the planetary nebula, the pre-planetary nebula, and amazingly, have you seen this paper that came out a week ago with the ALMA pictures of the, of the transients? So we're seeing the nebula of stuff that went off 15, 20 years ago. It's amazing. Anyway, so actually, oh, I put it in, I put it in last minute this morning. So this is it. So this is, uh, this guy here went off in 94. And we see this with ALMA today with, um, with the two outflows at about 100 and something, 30 kilometers per second. That's amazing, okay? We're gonna see the very transients we're observing the light curve for. Um, but if you uh, are not as rich as having these beautiful observations, you can look at nebula in the sky 
And some of them, you can presume, had an outburst at some point in the past. Now, I'm not going to talk about the preplanetary nebulae. I'm just going to mention that a lot of these preplanetary nebulae um, have these amazing collimations, multipolarity. And there's a very nice literature from Jason and Eric um, and Lucchini showing how the energetics of this stuff really is only consistent with some common envelope merger type phenomenon. Um, the planetary nebula are really interesting. Each and every one of these very varied objects in the middle has a very samey post common envelope binary. A boring pre white dwarf with a boring M star, all in periods of about half a day. Why are the planetary nebulas so different then? These are all similar common envelopes. What is giving that diversity? I mean, can that diversity be reversed and tell us something about what's going on in the common envelope? So this is another interesting story. This is another of our simulations. And at the very end, so these are you know, the usual orbital and perpendicular cuts. You can actually, this is SPH. SPH is, I love SPH because there's no box. And so you can go as far out as you want. Of course, resolution drops, but you get a lot of distribution. And I bugged Adam forever to take this and do something with it. And finally, when uh, Joe started working with Adam, he did just that. So we gave him this projected um, mold, if you will. And those of you who know um, post AGP evolution, you get a fast wind where the star is about 20 odd thousand Kelvin. And this fast wind, presumably spherical, just plows into the mold. And this is your mold. So what happened? So as we were happily and gingerly working, so Adam will talk about the details of this. but. Um, we found that somebody else, our good friend Guillermo Garcia Segura, had gone to our good friend Paul Ricker and picked up his mold. And so we had these two simulations, which are actually very different, but about the same thing. So this is Paul's simulation, and this is my one. Now, the difference here is that this was taken by Guillermo and projected, and so this is only a quarter, right? That makes it able to go a lot further when you, when you look at what happens than us. We stayed in 3D. But the other difference is that this was 57 days of ejection, so it's not very big. And this one was very similar uh, simulation, but taken to about 15 years, so it's bigger. Now, in, uh, put it to scale with one another, here they are. What they do share is that they have a thin funnel that will collimate the wind a lot. So this is Guillermo's, this is Adam's, and uh, this is the now, uh, they're about the same scale, and they're at about the same time. Now, uh, Guillermo went on a lot further than we did because we were in 3D. But what I take out of this, and Adam will give you all the details, is that this is a little thing and that's a big thing. So there's very strong 3D effects. Now, in the sky, there's this guy. It's not really fair to compare it because if you really knew what the mess of this, you would just say, don't put it up. But I'll do anyway. <laughs> and, and here you see, nobody's ever explained this tiny little arm with this thing, with the other big, big one. So 3D effects in common envelope are perfect to explain asymmetries like that. Um, and one more thing which I care a lot about is a symmetry of the common envelope ejection simulation appears to be prompted by simulating or not the Rochdal overflow. Now the mold I've showed you changes if I simulate the pre-common envelope Rochdal overflow or if I don't. So what I wonder is could it be that morphologies of planetary nebula change or are produced by how unstable the mass transfer is pre-common envelope. So that's a hypothesis. Um, and the last little item is jets. Uh, no one paid me to say jets a lot in this conference. <laughs> so I'll say jets again. These are not quite the jets no one wants me to talk about. He wants to talk about jets inside the common envelope. And I'm sure we'll have like the discussions. These are different. These are, you cannot see them here. There's one here and one there. These are the planetary nebula collimated out those. Now, what we thought is if you have launched this in a magnetocentrifugal way, then perhaps we can say something about magnetic fields. Turns out we have a bunch of these, not many, maybe six or seven, and we can do the kinematics of this bit and this bit somewhat well. And what we can tell for these two objects is that the, the outflows predated the common envelope by not very long, by you know, potentially centuries. And that tells you that perhaps this was a Rochdal overflow type jet that happened before the common envelope. And if that is the case, the measurement of the jets can be, and if you use Blanford and Payne, uh, so centrifugal um, theory, 
you can tell what the magnetic field that tore the material out of that disk was. And for these, it comes out at about a Gauss. Now, who knows what the geometry of the magnetic field looks like in those configurations, but a Gauss is about what you have at the surface of HP stars. So we kind of not, don't worry too much. Now, these guys, which are really weird, this is all twisted. This guy has two sets of jets. Perfect, I'm finished. Um, these ones, you can actually tell that these jets were formed after the common envelope ejection. In fact, in this, there's a beautiful paper by Martin Guerrero that shows how they pierce through the envelope. Now, if they were formed afterwards, I thought, I saw this, and I thought, ha, this is fallback of material onto the binary, and one jet is 500 kilometers a second, the other one is 100, perfect, one is a kind of more compact object, the other is a main sequence star, and great. We just, as you can see, fall back. It doesn't actually work that well if you, if you really look at all the observations. But what you can tell is that the kinematics of these jets, if indeed they come after the common envelope, they imply a magnetic field which is a lot stronger than for the other two objects, <clears throat> more like 100 to 1,000. The arrow bars are large, but this is quite um, you know, within that range. It's definitely not one gauss. You can't make these with blanford pain theory and one Gauss magnetic fields in the inner rim of this disk. Now, I exhumed from its tomb the Regos and Taut paper, uh, which talks about common envelope magnetic fields, and um, used their formula to figure out what type of um, wound magnetic field you might get in the common envelope, and it comes up to be ballpark this. Now, the question is, there's a lot of questions. First of all, Sebastian did a wonderful simulation with magnetic fields. But the magnetic fields that he was looking at were the magnetic fields in the disk around the companion as it goes inside the common envelope, not the alpha omega big magne uh, magnetic field. So we still don't know whether that is there, whether it is wound as per Regos and Tau, and if so, whether it is dynamically important. Um, however, I would say these jets are consistent with a relatively strong magnetic field. Again, if you can really think for a second what configuration you have in there at that time, it's complicated. So it's, it's not as simple, straightforward as I'm making it out to be. But um, can we just um, start with that? And so my conclusion, parameterization of the final separation, this is really what we want. How to do it is not clear, and the alpha equation, I think, is looking um, less and less promising. Um, individual uh, wider binaries, I think there's promise there to see whether we can probe the interface between this, the stable and unstable mass transfer. Transients and Likers, well, of course, this is going to be fantastic. Um, it's going to be uh, compared with, there's already lots of work going on. Nebula and jet, I think they tell you a lot about, again, ejection timing and potentially that pre-common envelope phase in the shape, of the, the shape of the planetary nebula, whether or not it's more or less symmetric. And of course, the jets potentially can probe magnetic fields. And I think I'm done. Thank you, Ursula. I think you added many more things to think about. So I'll open the floor. <coughs> Comments, questions? Uh, can I ask, so how was found this time delay of two times thousand years for the jet? I mean, I, on your previous slide, on your very yeah. last slide, it says that the jet was launched. This, this one or this next? This one. Yeah, but the jet was launched after seeing uh, several times thousand years. How is that what was found? So you, you look at the kinematics. So there's a lot of the, both these objects, but this I know very well. Is the kinematics of the object. So you can look at uh, the ejection speed, and then you wind back time uh, to determine when the ejection took place. Uh, so you have the speed and how far they are from the object. And of course, you've got some idea of the distance, or you can do it per kiloparsec if you want, but it's a relative thing. And then, of course, there's uh, some uh, lengthy um, uh, reconstruction there, too, because, of course, it's not, this is, each of these little bits of light is not like a bullet in through space, but there is, of course, a momentum conservation. There is an interstellar uh, component. There, so you, you, there is a reconstruction technique, but it is done with the kinematics. I was just going to say that uh, Pat Fagan has a, is a, The jet lag. Yeah, the jet lag of the torus. So I think it's like 100, uh, maybe 10 solar objects, so maybe 100 year 
100 to 200 year lag of the jet with respect to the The tor. So this is slightly different, but the idea of how it's measured is the same. It's done actually in molecular line, and it is looking at the prepian and it's looking at the tori and their kinematic properties to infer when they were uh, ejected, as well as the jets in this prepian, which are very collimated, where it does the same game, and then it has a relative age. And you can, you can, there are error bars, but you can be quite sure about the, the, uh, the way around, whether one started or the other one started. In this particular object in particular, actually there are signatures, uh, kinematic signatures in the base, here is very fuzzy, but in the base of this common envelope, who oh, is better, in the base of the common envelope, and you can see the piercing of the, of the jet coming through the, the bubble, or no, it's not a bubble, it's the, the, the distribution which you presume to be the common envelope. This object is amazing. It's probably the shortest period we know. It's 0.17 days. What's, is it both who do you generate stars? No, one is a general, the other one. They, they barely fit. I'm just curious because, I mean, it could be just the ne next episode of the mass transfer, not necessarily the consequence of the common envelope itself. I believe it's been observed, and there is no uh, flickering. There's no uh, indicator that they are not attached. What's the current uh, period? 0.17 days. So that actually, if you look at the size, pretty small. No, what, what I mean is that after the common envelope, the core expands and then recollapses. And then it, it, it's just the short term mass transfer event, but it's not the. That's so right. It, I totally agree. Mean it's effect from the core, it's not effect from the bounce. That's side. right. So I can say two things. One is that there's the observations are quite clear cut of that central star, and there's no evidence that they are in mass transfer phase. But uh, the other thing is that. Um, I, agree, I would agree with you, something's needed, because if you actually look at how tight this orbit is, there's no way it fits a disk, right? They're so close. Now, this thing was ejected a while ago, so something could have changed, but not the orbital separation. So I don't really know how to do it. If you actually look at all the numbers, there's no easy scenario you can so surmise. So the companion is almost filling its first line. Yeah, it's very close. Yeah, but we know degenerate course, we know that they expand on the thermal time scale and very collapse back. And during this expansion, then K issue of the thermal time scale mass transfer, but they don't have to be in the thermal time scale mass transfer now. But that's right. So, OK, I like that. Like that. So does something happen, exactly as you say, and then now they're not uh, overflowing anymore, but not long ago. This, what I love about this object is that whatever we talk about has happened in the last anything between 500 and a few thousand years, right? It's really fresh. What's the closest to the, the binary that you have evidence for jet? I, mean, that would give you some I think this is the closest period there. No, 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 like if, if, if it was transferring mass, producing a jet, and then it turned off, like the end of the jet, and that distance tells you something about Yeah, it's distance. hard to tell where the end of the jet is because it's going through, and I think you lose the base. Right. Uh, so I always say, oh, kinematics is easy, but you know, if you look at the papers that do it, you realize that just like measuring masses. Really good. So uh, one comment in the question about the uh, magnetic field. So like in Sebastian simulation, we essentially just switched on the magnetic field, and we are we are like running with full magnetohydrodynamics, right? So the beauty of this approach is that you don't need to make any assumptions which dynamo may may go, may go on there or not, right? Um, like you should see the dynamo. Like you should get the dynamo by itself, or you don't, because on for the model you're running, or for the part of the of, of the evolution that you're running, there just isn't a dynamo, right? And we, we but, clearly see some dynamo going on in the simulation, right? It's just like it's it's, it's limited sense. how far it like have the faster. Don't dynamo. you need a convection to get the alpha yeah, omega? So sure. there, there's there's convection going on in the simulations, but in the theory, I but think. It's, the, but the dynamic range of the yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. But it, this shouldn't, this, this shouldn't, yeah, so, so this should, the, the point here is that it shouldn't usually limit you how far you amplify, it should only limit you how fast you amplify, right? So because the, this, on the smallest scales, you usually, for most of these animals, you amplify the fastest. And so if you, if you clearly are saturated because something sets the magnetic field strength you reach, that's not the time you have to get there, which is in our simulation is clearly the case. You can usually be reasonably confident in the final strength of the magnetic field, right? You might have gotten it faster if you have higher resolution, but you usually shouldn't. You should you, go beyond saturation. You, you saturate to the same value because this the saturation is usually 
given by some kind of like larger scale property, like how much shear you actually have. Or so. And so the question then would be, if you assume that there are cases where there's like a stronger effect of the magnetic field, would you expect this to come from like early evolution that we don't have? Or would you expect this to come from the, like a, an interaction with the cores itself that of course we also don't have because our cores are just uh, point particles? Or would you expect this to yeah, something else that we are kind of physically lacking in the simulation to give some more effect? I mean, one thing is that you know, if, the, if, the, if there's accretion going on, if you produce a jet, it could be that the field is actually produced within you know, the dynamics of the accretion engine itself, yeah. in which case that would be... Why? Because the, this, effect. of course, we completely don't resolve yeah. that. But I would like to really understand whether the simulation of Sebastian and the group is the final word on that magnetic field amplification. And I don't understand. I mean, I know that in his first paper, Sebastian talked about a repo having the convec like the what looked like convection, but it's, that's not the con like it's it's like a uh, an idea that convection is that, that the materials convection are stable and it's starting to convert, but it's not full blown plume with nice spaghetti that are the size of the envelope and right. But at least in a dynamic phase, you don't have that much time. Anyway, right? like, no, no, that's so right. The question, yeah. so, so that would go more into the. If there is, of course, some amplification or change of the magnetic field in the, as I showed, in the 10,000 years that's heading like to the point where it actually plunges in, right? Then, of course, this this would be a completely different story. Uh, just just to clarify, because I think the Sebastian simulation more about amplifying the magnetic field in the envelope, but the jet is launched by the magnetic field of the companion. And it's very rarely we actually evolve the companion itself. Well, uh, well, okay. The companions are boring main sequence stars, which have been somewhat rejuvenated, possibly by some accretion. But I would say that the, the, the magnetic field that's threading the disk that's forming around the companion has something to do with material around it, rather than the, 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 the companion itself. The companion does not have a very strong magnetic field. It's not a white walk. No, it's a main sequence star. I really would say that, if, if at all, that, that the magnetic field is dragged, but then the question is, what is its shape? Because... So, so what's, it, what's a secondary? What's a... So let's say an M star, so half solar mass. Cool. Okay, so let's do main sequence stars here. No, the, so the, the primary is a core of a giant, so like a free white dwarf. In this case, a yeah, free okay, white so dwarf. that's the stuff I want to bring up since we're talking about magnetic fields. I feel like I'll uh, tell you the other option, which is from astrocosmology, it seems to have indication that about 50% of the core of stars above 1.2, 1.3 solar masses on the red giants have strong magnetic field of the order of 10 to the 4th to 5 Gauss. And those are hiding down in core, so they're never going to get to the surface unless somehow you remove the material. So another option is here that you remove the material, all of a sudden the magnetic field comes out, and then it's wind up into the binary. Uh, maybe that can participate that. That would be the other option instead of having to uh, generate magnetic field, which I tend to agree with Natasha. It seems to be possible in the envelope that it's then left. Removed, but yeah, not. that's right. It's that's actually hard to anchor it into the what is going to become the white dwarf. I totally agree. And actually, we did state that in the paper. It's like you know, it's all good and well to amplify the magnetic field, then you have got to keep it there. Yeah. And the it's interesting easy. thing about this, and I'm talking about numerology here, but you know, that's 50% of the star that we find uh, above certain mass, the one that's going to make AGB stars. Mm -hmm. They seem to have this strong magnetic field, and 50% they don't. I don't know why. But talking to people who does H AGB also uh, symmetry, it seems to be that that's also the case. And AGB is the nebulae, planetary nebulae. Um, they seem to have both geometry either completely symmetric or completely asymmetric. And the ratio seems to be also similar to 50%. I don't know if that's due to binaries. I, don't know I would not are. say <laughs> this. <laughs> we don't agree with this. that. Right. <laughs> Phil, you know more about this. But yeah. <laughs> this is people here. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to change the discussion a little. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about the alpha prescription, right? So like, there's several parts of this question. So the first part of the question is that like, um, people say alpha, right? It's actually not alpha, it's alpha lambda, right? So 
the problem, the question I have, like basically, how only if you use the lambda formula. Yeah, right. so, so lambda is. If you use the lambda formula, so, so this what? was just alpha. Right, yeah. so it's just alpha. So, so you ignore the lambda, lambda is just one. No, it? no, you, you fit it you fit, to, right. to whatever star you think you got. Okay, okay. So, okay. so you basically take some fiducial lambda which represents the binary of the alpha. Right, so you decide you got an RGB star of such and such characteristics, and you're going to use right. the lambda that's mostly descriptive for that type of star. As of you know, there's a lot of rich paper. Right. Okay. So, so uh, the surprising thing I, I, I see here is that basically, um, like my exposure to the alpha formulas of, was reading like high Neilman's paper, early two thousand, yeah, right, where he was fitting all these white dwarf binaries, and he found that these alphas which are ridiculously large, right? Like two to four to eight, right? <coughs> And now you're telling me that alpha is like 0.25, right? So what's the difference? So look, I, I think Sylvia can talk to this far better, but I, so that paper is another one of the ones that I've read more than once, and every time I get something else out of it. So he was actually doing double white works, right? So, and he could not, with the alpha formalism, reconstruct any sensible uh, Two phase of mass transfer. First episode, not the second. So the first. The first episode. And so, well, I would say but I would. So that's it. I, I would say that's a different thing, and I don't understand it very well. But here you have people. Sylvia, so Sylvia can No, because the, it was a point that I wanted to raise. So for, I mean, we can talk for a long time about the first phase of mass transfer for the double white horse, but if for a second we can focus on that second phase, and Gijs indeed found an alpha lambda by reconstructing it about two. And now, if you look at the results from Ursula and from Monica, from everybody, yeah. no, but just from the reconstruction method, yeah. you find something that's an order of magnitude lower. And I don't understand where this is coming from because they're, it's pretty much the same mass white horse, it's pretty much the same progenitor mass, mass ratios. Okay. I, 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 mean, oh, I mean, come with a lot. Sorry? I may come with a lot. Just a short comment. We can discuss it more little later. So, the first episode of mass transfer most likely was not unstable. So, I mean, you, you can forget. Yeah, about but for the reconstruction, the first phase doesn't matter, right? If you just yeah, so, on the so second speaking about the second, the question is what lambda is and how far into the core you will calculate <laughs> your binding energy, right? So, the place where you make a cutoff really important because binding energy changes very sharply as you approach the core. So the question is where you make that stop, and it can make difference. Yeah, it and we all discussed that, and, and there's been a, and you use, you can use different parameters, and you can see the difference it makes, which is large. Right, which but is why in the it's the alpha lambda thing, because right? that's what mm -hmm. Heist did, said alpha lambda. Yeah, so you're assuming you're not going to talk about the core, and you're going to wrap the lambda together with alpha, and okay. then great. So in that sense, it's, you know, but, independent of the model that you used, which might actually make, you know, give rise to a better comparison for, because you're not dependent on different ways of modeling the lambda, but it's still a question how you get larger than than one, right? Because especially for yeah, these were really lambda could be five. Exactly. And if you yeah. calculate the bounded energy, your true yeah. lambda could be five. No problem with that. But this is a problem. If you look at the, I mean, these were helium white dwarfs, and then if you look at the lambda, you expect something between 0.5 and one. So it still doesn't. It depends on how far in the hydrogen shell you calculate, right? That's so we it. should compare. That's the problem. The thing, though, it, to so an extent, in your model, if you plot an alpha lambda, if you take out what you get for the lambda, what do you get? What kind of what kind of values? Well, uh, the lambdas that I have, say for the HEB stars, if you look also at the log range, it's the it's another point point something, point two, point three. So. I think there are better ways of calculating lambda than but also, fixing it. But, but, but the bottom sure line is that everything is shrunk down to a very, very small thing. You have to use very low values of whatever parameter you you decide to adopt to match the observations, right? But that's the question now. Is that what we see for both common envelope binaries? Do we see the same for double white dwarfs? Okay, so that's a that's a good question. But if you just stick to the you know to the one object that we have here is for I mean, you can you can do the two groups, and why are they different is a good question. But even in the simplest form, you still have an issue where you have this very very short period binaries that imply that things are not efficient. Like whatever it is, is not efficient. It's, you're shrinking everything. And I should remind you of this issue of the AGB versus RGB, right? Because these two things, why are they different? Like why we find that these fluffy envelopes 
just don't, you know, they, they, they don't get ejected easily just because they're fluffy and light. Okay. Well, they don't get easily ejected because, because they're fluffy. Because their drag is absolutely, I totally agree, but, but then they're described in a somewhat different way. Yeah, yeah. We, that's, yeah. I think, a very important point that we don't mix different classes. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, anyway, Adam, you had a question a long time ago. Uh, it's about the jets and the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, I mean, you know, it's important to remember that there's, we have four, I don't know, at, least, at least three different ways of making the jets. You know, a disc around the secondary after a common envelope evolution, a disc around the primary after common envelope evolution because the secondary has been torn apart. Um, that's right, there's four. Actually, there's just the rotation. You can spin up the primary enough during common envelope evolution. Uh, so there's the paper that Eric and I did with Sean Matt with the idea that you wind up the magnetic field, and then as the common envelope is blowing material out, the, you sort of really, we call it the magnetic bomb, that basically, you know, you'll get that field unraveling or unwinding, and it's very, produces a very commonly collimated flows. And then, of course, lastly, during common envelope evolution, there should be a huge amount of accretion going on with the secondary, no matter what the secondary is. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to sort of keep in mind that that is the question of where we see the outflows, we see the effect of outflows, we see outflows coming from before and after common envelope evolution, but there are multiple routes uh, to, to do that. And in almost all cases, they're going to need magnetic fields. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I'd like to ask a very simple question. What, what are actually our problems right now? <laughs> <It's> theory, <laughs> no, 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 it's theory versus observation. I mean, one thing is very clear. Most common envelope binaries do not have a huge envelope around them. So we need to eject the mass. Fine, that's one issue. <laughs> the second question is, do we actually have a problem with the spell? Because hearing about observation and how you actually calculate it, what may it to me that we actually have a problem there? Maybe just a problem of how we actually interpret the observation, we don't necessarily have a problem with the inspire itself. Maybe the inspire is completely fine. So what you're saying, that with the observations, we got the alphas, we got whatever it is, it's, it seems to reproduce. It doesn't fully reproduce the observations, they, they don't inspire enough in the, in the so the, the observations are too tight, if you will, right? And if you just use that tightness to inform the population synthesis, you're not getting quite the same clear distribution. But other than that, you say, why don't we just happy with that? Well, I mean, yeah. Alpha isn't really a theory. A, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about. <laughs> no, I'm it's talking about ignorance. Full, full, full <laughs> simulations. <laughs> I'm not talking about right now. Let's full, sim full, full simulations. Yeah, no, they inspire. They have a problem. They don't unbind the yeah, envelope. Yeah, well, beside that, like, yeah, beside that. Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> okay. Second question about the, the, the final period. Do we have a problem or not? It's not very clear to me that we have. Maybe most we do. But most of the time, they do not achieve the final period. Mm -hmm. yeah, most of the time, they do not achieve a short enough period. How do you know what should be the final period? That's my question. From the observation. Like the kind of like if you take the systems that she reconstructs. Yeah, but the reconstruction yeah, is very, very problematic. But the period itself is perhaps the only thing we're reasonably okay with. Mm -hmm. So the period itself is a, I would call that a measurement. Like, I, I think we're no, no. I mean, some systems where we know very well like the, the, pre, the, 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 the RGB to, ones, I think. Yeah, that's some of them are really. Very well with why are we, why are, can we reconstruct them so very well? How do you know? Because we know, the, we know the, the period distribution of the progenitors. We know the period distribution of the progenitors. We think we understand RGB evolution as a radius uh, core mass relation, yeah. and um, and that's all that's needed to you know to reconstruct what uh, what the original periods ought to be. And we had a common envelope with simulations, which started with predicted initial conditions and ended with the observed. There's no problem. It's good. So we but good. <laughs> it doesn't transfer to AGB stars because AGB physics is a little bit but, more. But the problem is that most simulations don't actually eject the envelope. So you don't really know what the final separation is. So it could be, I mean, it, in a way, the, the simulations are, are compatible with the observations because you're still spiraling in. Your, 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 your separation can only decrease, and you haven't ejected the envelope yet. So in a way, I mean, just qualitatively, it is possible that you will eject the envelope at a much smaller birth. You know, well, we know that's that's not compatible with observations. That's so not as easy as that, right? And we know that um, it's. There's nothing to drag on at, at, by the time you, your envelope's not ejected, but it's out of the way-ish. Yeah. And, and, and of course, you just not, it's not gonna be that. And of course, with Natasha's ejection being kind of another business that takes place outside, 
that's really looking and so I I don't think the final separations in simulations and observations are really that big a problem. The problem is that uh, you're well, you still got a sample of combining issue that has to be solved, right, one way or another. And of course, all of the things that have been thrown at it are not 100% going to be it because the recombination energy may work. Even if it did work as well as Natasha says, it's only at a low mass regime. And then uh, Morgan says there's no, like, I should say jet one more time before I kill them all. Uh, says <laughs> that, you know, with Noah, we just did this paper where, well, he's done this for a long time. We've done it, we've done it with Enzo, where you jet inside a common envelope. Even if you assume the jets actually happen, you're only unbinding 30% more of the envelope, which is, is good, but it's not it. And Morgan says, you don't get disks that efficient inside the common envelope. Am I interpreting a bit correctly? I think that's correct. Right. So, I would say dust driven winds can work for anything. Now, that, I think, has got promise that stellar evolution takes over, right, in its, what it does even in single stars, prompted or, or stimulated by the spiral. Yeah. Any stars have no problem rejecting yeah. tons of mass. You don't really know why, but yeah. <laughs> Are there, um, when we look at the period distributions uh, in the observed systems, are there any reasons that we would be missing longer period systems if they were there. Um, so I've heard Katie Brevik, for example, talk about using Gaia as a potential tool to probe that tens to hundreds of days Look, regime. I, and I was just wondering if you could talk about it. Do you think there are any reasons? It's a good, it's a very good question. Where, where we might not be missing that. We are, yeah. that. So I would say no. It's really, so uh, the, the, uh, the Matthias Schreiber has been at it with radial velocities. If they've been there, they would have been found. I have done radial velocity. It's, there's really not, it, there's a few, right? There's a couple of PN with 15 day periods, but there's very, very, very few objects with, with, with that periodicity. And it's, it's not just missing due to the fact that the, the amplitudes will be smaller. With Kepler, we looked at and we found tons of small amplitudes, but they were all short periods and had small amplitudes for other reasons. With every time that somebody's been looking at the completeness, um, sure, we may miss some, but it's not. that's not the, the answer. Uh, well, I wanted to yeah. comment exactly on that, because it, from the observer point of yeah. view, I mean, it seems that, yeah, like longer periods are more difficult to tackle, because if you want to cover a certain area, you have to make a proposal, which, uh, if it's short duration, it would be approved. If it's a very long duration, it's like more questionable. Yeah. So yeah, my, my question is like, uh, what, uh, how the, the progenitors that uh, you discussed were selected and like what's the conceivable because um, the, you mean the, 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 the well, the, the periods for the post common envelope system that you mentioned. So, uh, okay, the, 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 the slow, the, the slow is from the spectroscopic yeah. survey uh, because they, they look, they are towards three epochs and where every time something moves, they go after it. In my, like the planetary nebula, which I've been after for a long time, uh, we've been monitoring them forever. Uh, so we, we have a lot of negative results as well, right? They have a lot of flatliners. And so we are pretty sure that from the ground, we can't do very well because of cadence. And we are limited to 0.1 magnitude, which seems preposterous. You can do 100 times better than that usually. But if you don't have the right cadence, you're, you're limited to that. And we get about uh, 15, 20% of the objects are variables. Kepler helped us to kind of realize that there's actually a lot more of them at low amplitudes, but they're not longer periods, right? So we're sticking to this uh, sample, which is uh, it's becoming, you know, it's as complete as the observation bias, but. No, one more question, that's Paul. Uh, there's more of a comment. Oh, um, uh, so, so with jets, um, I think it's important to uh, recognize that uh, jets during common envelope really the nature of them will depend strongly on the nature of the secondary. For example, with a, a neutron star uh, companion, you would expect, for instance, hypercritical accretion might produce more of a sort of a, a wind type of, uh, of, of uh, uh, feedback, whereas uh, maybe with uh, main sequence progenitor secondaries, you get something more like a collimated outflow. Right. And that, you know, that really affects the coupling of the outflow to the Okay, I want to end the discussion at this point.